Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host, and Adam, my friend here, is co-hosting the show with me. Happy New Year, Andy. Cheers to 2021. Let's hope this next year will be better than 2020. Can't be worse, right? Knock on wood. As we ring in the new year, I'm sure most of you are working from home like I am, and your kids are also going to school remotely. One of the things that's important is to make sure that your network at home and your kids' accounts are secure as well. So we're going to bring you a bonus episode today that's going to be focused on information security for parents and all the different consumer devices and consumer accounts that you may have and kind of give you some tips on how to secure your network, your machines, and your accounts from a personal standpoint. The first thing we want to dive into is how to secure your home network. Many of you who are listening to the show probably already know some of this stuff, but we'll go through some of the basics. First thing you want to do is to make sure that the credentials on your router are not set to the default credentials. Every router is a little bit different, but most consumer routers, you just have to go to a browser, go to the IP address of that router, which most likely is 192.168.1.1, or you can look it up to see what the the default IP address is for your router manufacturer on the internet. Once you browse to there, most likely the default credentials are admin admin, and you can set that password to something else. If you have an ISP router, they probably gave you the password for it that's on a sticker that's on the outside. You can reset that too, if you'd like, but most of the time those are fairly complicated. You know it's at least secure because they would have to have physical access to your home to look underneath the router or on the side to see the sticker. There are some benefits to purchasing your own as well. Most routers that you buy in a store are much better than the routers that are provided by your ISP. So if you have the opportunity, I would go and purchase one on your own. And there's several different types. Pretty much all the consumer routers are roughly the same and they haven't changed over the years, but there's a new type of router that's coming out called a mesh router or mesh network. And these are several different nodes that are placed around your home that can create a better connectivity and better range for your network. I have a mesh network. So I bought into the Eero system a few years ago, and I have been incredibly happy with this product. I think it's great. They have been bought by Amazon, but so far, it does appear that Amazon's allowing them to operate mostly independently. That's something we'll, of course, keep an eye on as privacy conscious, security conscious professionals. However, as of yet, I think you're still okay with Eero. A couple of interesting notes about that. Now, first off, I want to go back to something Andy said about ISP router versus buying your own. I definitely think you should buy your own as well. Just want to second what Andy said. A little pro tip for you. If you buy your own router and your ISP's device is also trying to do routing, any technical person knows you have what's called double NAT or double network address translation, which is bad. You do not want that. However, the way to get out of that's really, really easy. Your ISP has the ability to put their router into what is called bridge mode, which essentially sets all the router capabilities off and makes it go back to just acting like a good old fashioned dumb cable modem, which we love. And the best way to do that, I have discovered, at least with my ISP, so I have Mediacom here in Iowa, is to talk to their Twitter support. Because you can just say, hey, can you put my router in bridge mode? And they'll validate your customer information and they'll do it. And it's fantastic. Way easier than a phone call where you might get a technician that doesn't know what you're talking about. So that's definitely something to look into if you do want to replace the ISP router is also making sure that all of their routing capabilities are disabled, the Wi-Fi radios are disabled, and you're just running with your own. So back to Eero, it's a really awesome product. It's a mesh network where you put different nodes around your home, like Andy mentioned, so you get great signal strength no matter where you are. But there is something about it that might be a bit of a turnoff to the more technical or tinkerers amongst us. We have a group chat with Andy and a couple other guys that we used to work with, and these guys are always geeking out over their super complex network setups. They've got stuff in racks, and they have all these different devices, and they're putting APs everywhere. And I have this Eero network where literally 
literally there is no web interface. You control it through an app on your iOS or Android device. And in fact, it requires internet access to even be able to access the admin panel, which is also maybe a turnoff. Like if you can't get connectivity, there's no way to connect to the Eero to find out why it doesn't work. So those might be two, maybe not so good things about it. But for the downsides, I'd say the upsides are super easy to set up, super easy to use. There's not a lot to tinker with, which is good if you have a tendency to tinker and you don't want to. And then from a, a security or parental controls or, or parenting information security strategy perspective, there are some nice built-in capabilities there. So they have a subscription service called Eero Secure Plus, and it's something like a hundred bucks a year. And it comes with several features and services that are included. One of which is one password for families, which is Andy and I's password manager of choice. And you get a subscription to that, which I think is the same value. So literally you use one password and it's paid for itself. And then on top of that, they've partnered with Zscaler to do a whole bunch of web filtering, web content filtering baked right in. So you can pick out certain devices on your network and say for those devices, automatically enforce safe search in Google or Bing, automatically limit the ability to access these type of sites that I don't want those devices to access. So kind of built-in network level filtering that you don't have to do anything to do. You literally just flip a switch and also blocks like malicious sites, advertising sites, all that sort of thing as well. So I have network-based filtering where if I try to, you know, let's say go to a local TV station and you know they have the grossest web pages with ads out your ears, all the ads are blocked and they're blocked at the network level. It's super awesome. I love it. So anyhow, definitely a plug for Eero. It's not going to have all of the switches to throw or knobs to turn that you might get with some of these other solutions that I think Andy's going to get into a little bit. But if you want your network to be more set it and forget it, and then want to do more of your information security strategy elsewhere, this is a great option where you just plug it in and it just kind of works. And it's got some great parental controls features baked right into it. So big two thumbs up from me from Eero. Had it for a couple years and pretty big fan. One thing I want to mention before we dive into some more complicated network setups, you can also stack a personal router behind an ISP router. If you do that, you just want to make sure that the DHCP scopes don't overlap. So for example, if your ISP gives you router and sometimes the router and the modem are one piece and you can't get another router, you can stack a personal router behind it just by plugging in your second router into one of the empty LAN ports. You just need to make sure that the inside side router has a different DHCP scope than the outside router. So 192.168.1.1 may be your default router for ISP, but then inside the DHCP scope, you need to set that to say 192.168.2.1. And that provides a second layer, second firewall even to your inside layer. So you can put guests on the outside Wi-Fi. Let's say you keep the Wi-Fi on for the ISP and you say, here's the guest password and everything is on that. And then you, on the inside, you put your own devices and the guests won't be able to network into your devices because it's on a completely separate network. There are some other mesh networks out there. I know Google has a, its own mesh network. Ubiquity, which is a brand I'm going to dive into, they also have their own mesh networks. They're great because just like Adam said, they're mostly plug and play. A lot of the UI and the features are all built in. You plug them in, they have great instructions, stand them up, and they have great connectivity. One of the cheaper methods for what's called a controller-based network is Ubiquiti's Unify line. And as Adam said, we have a group chat and a bunch of us have Unify controllers. They have something called a Dream Machine, which is an access point, switch, and controller all built into one. It's a great device if you want to get started on controller-based networks, but you can also buy them separately. They have something called a USG, which is a security gateway, essentially a firewall. Then you can buy a switch, and then you have to have an access point. And the access points are powered by Ethernet, so PoE, and the switches are PoE enabled. The controller could be stood up on any device that you own in the home. Could be on a Windows machine, could be on a Mac, could be on a Linux box. It's software that's installed. You run the controller. The machine has to be on if you want to contact the controller. You can also buy something called a cloud key, which is a PoE powered, essentially a mini computer, which has the controller software installed already on it. The controller is there in order to send different 
different signals to the devices that are out on your network. So if you want to set the name of your Wi-Fi network, if you want to designate which switch ports are on or off or which VLAN it's supposed to be on, designate different VLANs, the IP addresses for those VLANs, all of that is controlled through the controller and you access it through a web UI. For new information security folks who are trying to get into networking, this is a great way to learn if you want to stand up your own controller-based network at home and essentially run it like a small business. When it comes to filtering, it doesn't have anything built in like Euros. I used to use OpenDNS. That's a great product that you can use for personal use and you can set the DNS of your network to OpenDNS and filter out different categories, filter out different mm -hmm. malicious sites. And you can do this with Ubiquiti's Unify or personal router. Just go into the router settings and set the DNS to OpenDNS. Right now I use Quad9, which is a more security-based type DNS. It doesn't have filtering built in for other categories that you may want to filter for for kids, but it does do the security part of it. So malware, malicious sites, those sorts of things. I use a product called Circle by Disney, which I highly recommend for folks if you're not on the Eros path and have the Zscaler part built in. Circle is a great little appliance that you can plug into any router. It'll do the same thing that the Eros network does. It identifies all the different machines that are on your network and you can assign them to different profiles. Once they're assigned to different profiles, you can designate what categories or age groups of applications that that device can access. So if I didn't want my kid going to YouTube, I can block it using the Circle appliance. And it can do safe search and all the other things. You can also set time limits, which has been great for my kids. There's time limits throughout the day, how long they can be on the internet. There's also bedtimes and off times. So I set a bedtime so automatically the internet turns off for all of their devices at 8 p.m. They also, during school nights, only have two hours of internet total. And then in the morning, the internet doesn't start until after they go to school. They used to just sit on their iPads in the morning when they got up and it was like pulling teeth to get them to get ready for school. Now the internet doesn't turn on until they're already in school. So it's been a great way to manage that. And the appliance is fairly inexpensive. You can pay for a subscription and it actually becomes a consumer MDM solution. If you pay the subscription, I think it's around a hundred bucks a year, you can install a VPN profile on their devices. And then wherever they travel with that device, it will then contact the Disney Circle servers and pull your policies down and apply them anywhere that they're connected to the internet on that device. So that's handy if you're going somewhere or traveling or as they get older, you can put this on their phones and you can filter content on their phone if they're at school. You can turn off the internet if they're at school. I don't know how successful that is. My kids are still young. I don't know what it would be like to have a teenager and limit them on the internet during the school day, but it's a great product. I highly recommend it, especially for younger kids. Definitely if you're having issues with older kids using their devices when you don't want them to, this is an easy way to just plug it into your home network at least if you don't want to pay for the subscription and have off times designated for those devices. Andy, I know you've had that Disney Circle for a couple of years, and I know you've been super happy with it. I remember you talking about it uh, several years ago. So it's it's nice to hear that over the long run, it's still a product you like and recommend. Because I know as information security professionals, a lot of times we like to roll our own. We don't like black boxes. We want to know what's inside the black box and how it works and how it ticks. But man, there's something to be said sometimes for having an SLA, having somebody else responsible for it, having other support for it, and you just set it and forget it. There's enough to worry about, especially when you're a parent, that it's nice to have things that you just plug in and they just do their thing. And both Eero Secure Plus, it sounds like for me, and Circle by Disney for you, both sound like solutions where, you know, it's possible to probably roll your own and do some Franken solution, but man, it's nice sometimes to just have it plug and play too. Definitely. One of the solutions that we've talked about in our group chat is Pihole. And you mentioned that for Eros, you get all your ads blocked automatically. Pihole's something that does that as well. If you do some research, you basically stand up your own DNS server, pull in ad blocking URLs, and then you can block ads at the network layer with your own DNS server. There's guides on the internet. It can run off a Raspberry Pi. It can run off almost anything. And I've done this and I've also run into issues with it because it's blocked things. It takes a long time to tune it. So at the one hand, it's nice to tinker with it and to have your own and to be able to block things on your own 
own. But at the same time, it takes a lot of time to troubleshoot and fix things when you could just offload it to like a product like Euros. So moving on to securing your machines, we'll start with Windows machines. Highly recommend that you use Microsoft accounts. You can create those just at Microsoft.com and make sure that you have MFA turned on. We've talked about Microsoft accounts on the show before. They have a lot of cool things like passwordless authentication. Pretty soon they're going to have no passwords. So make sure that you use the Microsoft accounts. When you have a Windows machine, you can sign into them and sync everything to your Microsoft accounts. You also get parental controls. So if your kid has a Windows machine, you can use Microsoft Families and essentially onboard that child account into your family, which is great because you can set different time limits just like the circle, but this would be specific to Windows and also Xbox. You could manage them separately or you can manage them together. At first, when my kids were starting out, I just did a time limit for all devices, Xbox and Windows. Now that they're getting a little bit older and they play different things, I separated out and have different time limits and different schedules throughout the day when they can play Xbox and when they can play on their computers. And when you have a child account that's attached to your family account, it automatically makes them a user, not an admin, when they sign into that machine. And so if they need to purchase apps on the Microsoft Store, if they need to install an application, all of that requires your admin password in order to approve that purchase or that install. And it also syncs with Windows Hello. So if you have biometrics enabled, it's super easy or a pin. When that prompt comes up for admin access or to purchase, if you're standing right there, you can just use your Windows Hello method and authenticate it. For browsers, I definitely recommend just using the Microsoft Edge. All of the parental controls will be built in from the Microsoft account, as well as turning on smart screen, which is a security feature in Windows 10. If you use another browser, for example, like Firefox, it gets a little bit more complicated because Firefox has its own DNS enabled for it. Now it uses DNSSEC, which basically runs DNS over HTTPS, and that will circumvent the controls that we talked about previously. If you're using like OpenDNS or Quad9 at your router, Firefox will just circle around that and circumvent it. So just use the default edge. It's a great browser. And I highly recommend if you're not using Eros or PyHole or some other ad blocking tool to just install an ad blocker in the extensions. I personally use uBlock Origin. It automatically blocks a lot of the malicious ads and any of the ads that the kids might click on. So install some sort of ad blocker in the browser if you don't have any other method for blocking ads already. Switching gears over to iOS, and actually a lot of this can apply to macOS as well. We'll reiterate and we'll say this for every account type. Again, set up MFA on your iCloud account as well. And there are a lot of great controls built in. First off, the number one thing you should do if you have not already done it is you should put all of your accounts together in a family. So Apple supports the concept of family sharing, and this lets you share a lot of content between all of your iCloud accounts that are linked as part of a family. And so if you've been using like one shared iCloud account, now is a good time. Take a little bit of time and stand them up for all of the kids, stand one up for the spouse, and everyone's on their own account. You can still share things like Apple Arcade, Apple Music, Apple Fitness Plus. You can do shared iCloud storage. So if you're paying for additional iCloud storage for your iOS backups or your iCloud photo libraries, you can share that. So you'll just buy like the two terabyte one and then share it amongst everyone, which works great. And there's a ton of benefits to doing it. So long story short, stand that up first. Then once you've stood that up, that unveils some capabilities. So for example, there's the concept of screen time controls. And you've seen the screen time reports probably on your own iPhone or iPad as well. But there's the capability to control this on your children's devices. And so you can do things like to say for this app category, you can only use it for X amount of time per day. So for example, social networking maybe is limited to two hours a day, but educational is unlimited or reading. You know, if you want to be in the Kindle app and read, by all means, knock yourself out. You can do that all day long, but maybe let's limit your time on Snapchat, for example. So that's all built right in there. Works super well. I've used this for quite some time now, and it's great. Another nice thing, and and Andy talked about kind of a similar flow for Windows and Microsoft accounts, is that if your children want to buy an app, you can link all of the payment information together. So there's one card that's essentially on file for all of your family accounts. And if your children want to buy an app, whether it's a free app or it's a paid app, they send a permission request to you. And so you 
get a notification on your Apple devices that will say, hey, child one wants to buy this app. Is that okay? And then you can approve or decline it as appropriate. So that's nice as well. And then one thing we're going to put in the show notes here is a document Apple released recently that is kind of making the rounds on InfoSec Twitter. And it's around device and data access when personal safety is at risk. That's the title, which sounds kind of weird. I was kind of wondering what the thesis of this is. Like, what's what's the use case? What is this for? And upon further inspection, I believe this is really designed for scenarios where there is a dissolution of a romantic relationship between two partners and there's the potential for something bad to happen. And essentially it walks through all of the sharing that might be turned on on your device, perhaps by a not well-meaning ex-partner and ways you can control that and disable that as appropriate. Now, why are we mentioning it in this conversation around for parents? Well, we are equally concerned with the personal safety of our children, of course. And so a lot of this advice still applies in those scenarios. We want to know, is my child's device, their iPhone, sharing their location? And who is that being shared with? Those are things you might want to consider and lock down appropriately as well. So I think even though this is not perhaps the primary scenario this document is written for, I think there's a lot of value. So check that out in the show notes. Really great document by Apple that walks through all the different kinds of personal sharing that happens on your iPhone or iOS device in general and ways you can manage and control that appropriately. And Andy, I'll throw it back to you to talk about Google and Android. Both Adam and I, we don't really use a ton of Android devices. I have in the past, so we're not experts on them, but we have Google accounts. And just like with any other account, make sure that you MFA them. Google does have a family account as well. These are controlled through an app that you download on iOS or Android, and you can link your family accounts together. Same concept. It supports different controls on time and for installation of apps from the Play Store. A lot of schools also use Google or G Suite for school accounts. I would recommend that you monitor your kids' school accounts and what they're using them for. Because they're Google accounts, they can be used to sign into almost any type of Google app including YouTube. You probably don't want your kid using YouTube and uploading videos to a YouTube account that's associated with a school. So just make sure that you're monitoring which apps that they're signing into, where they're signing into their school accounts. I would also do a cursory inspection of their account in the settings and see what they've authorized for OAuth. A lot of sites say just sign in with Google and if they're already signed in with their school account, it'll just authorize that school account to access that site. Make sure that you go through that and check to see if those are sites that need to be authorized with their school account. You can also go through the history of what they've done, where they've gone, all within the settings of the Google account. For Android, one of the biggest attack opportunities is when an app is sideloaded. There's a lot of malicious actors, especially when it comes to games, that will develop an application that's fake and tout it as a real app and then have the user sideload it onto their Android device, which means that they're not downloading it from the Play Store that has been vetted through Google. They just download the APK from a website, and then you can install them directly onto the device. This has happened with Fortnite. It's happened recently with Cyberpunk, which is another game that came out. Malicious actors developed the quote-unquote mobile application, and people have been sideloading them onto their devices and infecting them. So make sure that you're educating your kids and taking a look at those devices to make sure that they're not installing anything that's not from the Google Play Store. And Andy, for Fortnite, that was actually legit at first. That's how Epic Games was trying to distribute it, was telling everybody to sideload it, which is kind of bananas, but that's a deep rabbit hole as well. Much better to load stuff just through the Google Play Store, of course, where it is vetted and has had eyes on it. But that is not a guaranteed source of well-behaving apps. There's always reports popping up every couple of months where App X was on the Google Play Store and it turns out it was just harvesting contact information or location data or whatever and doing something malicious with it. So it depends on your children's age, of course, and, and there's different discussions 
transitions that happen as as they progress through ages. Once they reach a point when you can have a conversation with them around the kinds of permissions apps request, that's obviously another conversation we need to have here in these digital times is explaining why we might not want to just say yes to everything an app asks for. Just because it asks for it doesn't mean we need to give it to them. Just because Facebook wants to use my microphone doesn't mean I have to say yes, for example. So anyhow, not to go on a big tangent, but there's there's opportunity there to educate on things like sideloaded apps or even the permissions apps request, again, as children are mature enough to handle those conversations. And so as long as we're on the subject of Android, let's switch gears and talk about updates. And this is something Andy and I, I think, both have pretty strong opinions about and, and we're aligned on this, is, of course, updates are important. We all know updates are important. And Android has historically had an update problem. And that's not any Android hate or anything. That's just the reality of the situation. It has gotten better over time because Google has removed a lot of the security related controls and and code and has broken those out into Google Play services that can be updated independently of the operating system. However, there are still going to be things that are part of the OS that need to get updated sometimes, especially if, for example, a new zero day is discovered. And so if you are running an Android device that is made by pretty much anybody not named Google, you may have problems getting timely updates. This is why Andy and I really recommend as much as possible, you should stick to pure Google Android devices like the Google Pixel series for smartphones. That way you're not going to have any blockers on receiving those updates as quickly as possible. And you're going to have the best experience as well. And so if you are somebody who's concerned about information security, having that gap from discovery of vulnerability to it being patched and how many people have to sign off on it before it happens, like your cellular carrier has to approve it for a lot of those other OEMs, it's just kind of a nightmare scenario. So stick to the pure Google stuff and you'll be in pretty good shape. And that really aligns more to how some of the other manufacturers do it. Andy, do you have another example? Yeah, so for iOS, it's really nice because Apple controls not only the devices, but also the operating system that runs on these devices. And they only have so many iPhone models out, and they can tailor these operating systems specifically for these iPhones, and they keep them up to date. And when we say up to date, it's not only the security vulnerabilities, but it's also the drivers for those devices. Because Android has so many different devices that run Android, it's very difficult to to update not only the vulnerability, but also the d- device drivers. With iOS, it's much easier. And so iOS does a great job. If you buy an iPhone or an iPad, all those drivers and vulnerability updates, security updates will come right through the Apple iOS updates. And so it's very easy. Most of the time they install automatically. If you have the little red one next to your setting, take the time to update it. Otherwise, it usually will have it by default update at night when it's plugged in. And Apple does a really, really, really good job of supporting their devices for a very long time. I have an iPhone 6S here, and it is still receiving updates. And I believe that's from, what, 2013? So seven, eight years old at this point. Still getting OS updates. It still runs iOS 14. That's fantastic on a smartphone that is that old to still be receiving updates. And so one thing on that note that is maybe, I mean, this is like nitpicking just to nitpick here, but as an awareness piece, Apple generally Generally speaking, there are exceptions, but generally speaking, does not ship security updates for past versions of iOS. They do on the Mac, but we're not talking about the Mac right now. On iOS, the current version is 14. Apple's really not shipping security updates for iOS 13 anymore, which means if you do have an iPhone that is no longer receiving the current iOS, and I don't even know where the cutoff is, it's also not getting security updates at that point. So given how generous Apple is with updating very, very old hardware, it shouldn't hopefully be too much of a problem for anyone, you know, from a economic perspective. But just keep that in mind that those devices that have moved out of support for iOS, they're also not getting security patches, generally speaking. Now on the Mac, just for completeness, Apple tends to issue security patches for minus two Mac OS versions. So if the current version is, well, it's Mac OS 11 now, but let's say back when they were doing like 10.14, 10.13, 10.12, if the newest version was 10.14, 14, then 13 and 12 will receive updates as well. So that's one 
good thing that's a little different about the Mac compared to iOS is it does receive security updates for older versions, comparatively speaking. But just keep those up to date, of course, and you'll be in good shape. And for the most part, unless your hardware is aged out, you are eligible to get updates. So do them. And for Windows PCs, I usually only get Surface devices for my family now because just like Apple and pure Android devices, the security updates and the device drivers come through Windows updates. So for my wife, she has a Surface device. I don't have to worry about updating the BIOS. I don't have to worry about updating any of the drivers. That just comes through Windows updates, which is automatic. If you have like a Dell or a Lenovo or some other manufacturer, you have to generally do those updates on your own. The operating system will get updated for sure through Windows updates, but it's really the drivers and the BIOS, which also have vulnerabilities that need to be updated manually. Just the other day, one of the last days of the working year before I called it a year, my Surface Book 3 received a whole bunch of firmware updates and they're actually like color coded. So when you receive a firmware update, it just downloads them through Windows Update and it reboots itself. And then you get the Surface logo. Well, actually, it's the Microsoft logo on the newer ones. And then there's a progress bar and the progress bar is color coded. And so I had, boy, two or three different progress bars where one was yellow and one was blue and one was green. And then they all completed and it rebooted and I was good to go. And it had done updated firmware for like three different pieces of hardware in my device. I don't even know what they all were. One might have been the overall firmware. One might have been specifically for a drive controller. One of them might have been for the graphics card. Who knows? But it was seamless to me. I didn't have to do a darn thing. I just rebooted and installed Windows updates like I always do. So that was really slick and certainly real world experience of how not only am I getting Windows quality updates and Windows cumulative updates and feature updates, but I'm getting those driver updates and firmware updates as well. And I don't have to do anything. So, you know, when we talk about security, sure, you could have a Lenovo and you could dutifully go check their website or set up an RSS feed or something to look for a new BIOS to be released or UEFI. And then you can download that to a flash drive or God forbid, like a floppy drive or something where you have to do something goofy to install it. Or, you know, you could just buy a Surface and it just does it itself. So definitely a plug for that as well. We'll put a bunch of links in the show notes for the products that we talked about today. Hopefully we've given you something to think about and some to-dos to go and check your accounts, your devices, your network. If you have any questions, definitely reach out to us on LinkedIn or Twitter. As always, thanks for listening. If you have any security topics you want us to talk about or have additional questions, our contact information is in the show notes. Thanks and see you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.